Okay, welcome uh, to another episode of Stockport Grammar School Talk Sport. Today, we've got an exciting guest. We've got Robbie Phillips, pro climber. Uh, welcome to Stockport Grammar School Talk Sport, Robbie. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Just uh, sitting here in my living room. <laughs> different, to our, different to our crag or a mountain. Um, no, definitely. Right, so we'll, we'll start off with then a little bit about your background, Robbie, and your journey to where you are today. Yeah, of course. Um, so... Um, I started climbing when I was 15 years old. Um, I actually started through the Duke of Edinburgh Award, if you believe. Um, I remember, I actually remember the day that um, I kind of discovered climbing because I walked into the library at my school, George Watson's College in Edinburgh, um, and uh, and they had like this booklet on the Duke of Edinburgh Award. I remember you to do the Bronze Award, you had to do a sport, a skill, and a charity. And on the list of sports that you could do, there was climbing. And I remember doing climbing. My mum had taken me climbing like years ago and taking an indoor climbing wall. She was always like taking me to try lots of different things as a kid because she wanted to help me find something that I loved at nine or 10 years old. And I thought, you know what? That'd be a really cool thing to do. And so um, I, remember I went down to this little tiny climbing wall in Edinburgh called Alien Rock. And I met an instructor there and I asked him if he could be my assessor for the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And I went back every Friday um, to meet this guy, his name is Johannes, and he took me climbing for the, for the session. And at the end of the three month period, because you had to do three months of, of this thing, get it signed off every, every day, every week. And then at the end, I was really upset because I was like, oh, I've absolutely loved this so much and I wanna keep doing it. And, uh, and he said, well, Robbie, you don't have to actually stop. You can keep going. So I did. And you know what? I never actually did get my Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award. <laughs> but I found climbing, and that, was, and that was pretty much it. And then from there, it kind of just uh, it got more and more. So I was going every Friday, and then I ended up joining a club at the other climbing center. Um, and then at the school I actually went to, they actually had a club, so I ended up doing that as well. So I went from one day to two day to three day a week. And then I ended up getting invited onto sort of a, a local team that focused on competitions. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, as a person, I've always been quite competitive. Um, and so competitions were quite a natural way to sort of um, kind of follow that competitive streak of mine. Um, and, and I ended up competing for quite a number of years until I was about 19. Um, I competed on the GB team. And the GB junior team um, for a number of years competed in world youth cups, European youth cups. Um, but what I did find was that my uh, my interest in competitions did start to wane as I got introduced more by my mentors into the outdoors. Yeah. And uh, and as I just started to discover, you know, travel and and climbing outdoors and the challenges that offers, that was kind of what really piqued my interest in the sport. And so after like 19, I ended up just like going abroad and climbing for many years, trying to sort of like make it as a, as I guess, a, I guess as a professional climber. Um, and I guess if you don't know climbing, you won't know the individual disciplines, but that, that is, that is like what I ended up, what I've started and what I am doing now is like so completely different, like two ends of the spectrum, basically from competition climbing to what is regarded as called sport climbing and bouldering, which is a, a relatively safe aspect of the sport, but very much more um, focused on the physical aspect of climbing, all the way up to what I do now, which is traditional climbing and big wall climbing and expeditions. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of been my, my journey from beginning to current at the moment. Anyway. Wow. And, and if it wasn't for Duke of Edinburgh, it may never happen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was watching The Crown recently, and it's actually like a, an episode where the Duke of Edinburgh actually is starting the Duke of Edinburgh. And I was like, man, I will watch that guy. <laughs> and what we're talking about on this series a little bit is high performance. And from your experience, your journey, you've achieved high performance in climbing. What, what does that mean to you, high performance? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I guess people's perceptions of high performance, I think in general, is being the best or, or winning. I guess in school, it could be getting an A. Um, but to me, it's actually more about your personal attitude to achieving your potential, irrespective of whether that's at the upper tier or not. I mean, in climbing, high performance 
you know, can be seen as being GB team member competing for their country in a World Cup. Um, but in, in my opinion, it's also an amateur climber trying to achieve their goals. At school, it could be a grade A student, but also a C average student striving for a B. It's the attitude to high performance, you know, that I think is is a thing that I think I'm really interested in. And uh, I think in climbing, it's really intrinsic, this particular attitude to high performance because of the nature of the sport. Yeah. And, and I, I feel it. Like it's like the, you know, we're always sharing our playing field, essentially. Um, you know, when you're at the crag, you could be climbing with a world-class climber or, you know, other amazing climbers. And you could just be a beginner or an amateur. And the sort of amateurs and pros can be climbing side by side. They could be socializing at the crag, sharing information on the climbs, you know, sharing uh, stories, uh, sharing training tips. I think from that aspect, it's a, it's a real really good community for, for sharing. But I, I always like to think of it like this. You know, it's, it'd be very difficult to organize a kickabout with David Beckham or Wayne Rooney. It'd be difficult to climbing with like one of the world's best climbers because you will literally see them at the crag. Yeah. And, and for that aspect, I think that really cultivates a good attitude around, um, around high performance. I mean, I mean, basically, like what high performance is in my mind is a directed approach optimizing your potential in any area and um, not a random set of activities to achieve a random result but a focused strategy strategy um, to achieve generally a, a pre-planned yeah. objective and um, so that's like a training plan goal setting long-term strategy and irrespective of the level you're at in sport or, or in anything you can you can do that basically yeah so look, 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 really what you're saying there is just be the best version of yourself yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. I know. I mean, like, I, I, uh, I, I don't think I was very natural, you know, at climbing. Um, I, I still don't think I'm. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I'm. I'm not someone who naturally uh, builds the right muscles. You know, I start when I was fifteen years old. I was a rugby player. I was a prop. You know, if you believe it or not, I'm quite skinny now. But like, you know, it wasn't a natural development for me. So I had to really think about. Uh, really carefully at how I trained and how I approached climbing to, to get the most out of it. And I, I was competing, at the time I was competing against guys who had been climbing a lot longer than me. Um, and and I had, I don't know, I just had to really think strategically about how I approach this this new sport and, uh, and how I get the most out of it. And so, yeah, like having the, a good approach to high performance, I think made a huge difference. So for you then, like high performance is, predominantly if you want the way you think of it is based around a mindset so yeah. at what point on your journey then from you know being as you say that not natural climber but you know you were climbing so much you're almost seven days a week you were in the wall climbing at what point did you use that mindset to actually focus to actually make the physical improvements if you want so if you've got that essentially you had an elite mindset very early on and knew what you wanted to do and knew uh, where you wanted to be, how did you use that to actually essentially transfer that into gaining the elite performance? Yeah. Um, so I would say that I was, I was pretty insatiable with my appetite for learning and, and very passionate about, about the activity I was doing, which gave me a drive that I think others didn't have. Or at least others I was surrounded by didn't have. Um, I, I guess I would I was I was like devouring like books on training, um, which at the time when I was when I was younger, you know, like climbing training wasn't really highly developed. It was it was still lots of just ideas being thrown about by you know better climbers. But that's the other thing as I was I was actually like I was being a bit of a pain in the butt, you know, with other with the professional climbers and the other climbers that I knew and could see at the wall. I was, always asking them you know like oh what do you do for this and i mean even even now actually i get something like oh you were an annoying little kid by the way <laughs> but i guess like that got me somewhere because i was because i was keen you know and, and they were they were keen to kind of like guide me as well um yeah i mean i think from the from the beginning really like i i was i was driven i was motivated um and i think i was from the very first time you know, I walked into that climbing wall and I went up to that instructor and asked him if he could be my assessor. 
you know, I can remember every session I would ask, you know, what do I do to get better? I wasn't afraid of asking questions. Um, so I think, you know, from the start, really, that, that made a huge difference. Yeah, no, definitely. What comes across from you there, uh, Rob, is basically your love for learning, but also that curiosity and how important that is. Uh, yeah. I think they're linked together there. No, good. And then next question is um, role models and people who have influenced you on your journey. Um, have you got any that stick out in your mind and, and why? Um, yeah. So I'd say, like, um, I'm trying to think how to best. So the, I, I would say I have, like, Two, I had two mentors in climbing, yeah. um, who Adam uh, knew very well as well. A guy, guys called Neil McGeeky and Neil Busby. Um, I mean, they were they were literally just climbing instructors um, at the wall. Um, I, and you know, like when I when I uh, first went into the climbing center um, for a session, it was Neil Busby who was taking the. You should you should try and join us in this group because this is a group for like really keen climbers, um, and then it was Neil McGeeky and Neil Busby that took that session afterwards. I mean, at the time, those guys would just have been like twenty five years old themselves, you know. So so young guys, but both of them really experienced climbers, um, and uh, and Neil McGeeky in particular, he was really one of the top climbers um, at the time in Scotland, and although I didn't really realized that at the beginning you know he was teaching me a lot about you know you know how to train and uh and also just and also just both of them were training taught, teaching me a lot about the ethics of climbing yeah. and 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 how to be a good steward for the community more than just a good climber and um, which you know I, I look about i look at back and i think about you know what were the big influences in my life um not just as a, a climber but as a human being and i would say those two people have made such a big difference because it's definitely the way I hold myself in the climbing community and um, understanding that I have a position of influence um, you know as an ambassador for the sport you know I, I need to have a good understanding of the ethics of you know my area and climbing and be flexible to others opinions but I guess, I guess just be a good steward for the community and, and put my best foot forward so I think those two guys in particular were, were very influential in that respect yeah, um, yeah. And I would say my other huge influence um, was my dad. Um, my dad actually passed away a few months ago, um, and uh, it has made me reflect on on basically what he has taught me um, and how how he taught me to live. Basically, my dad's work ethic was unlike any human being I've ever seen. And growing up um, as a youngster, like as a kid in this in his house like uh i basically didn't want to grow up to be like my dad because he worked so unbelievably hard um you know i would he would give me a lift to school in the morning and i wouldn't see him till like nine ten o'clock at night when he got back from work and i always thought that his work ethic was uh was like well i always thought that he he didn't live a very nice life because he was always working so hard but in a strange turn of events i actually feel like i become my dad and um, because I worked so hard at climbing and, and at my career and and you know and making a living out of what I love and and what I realize now um, is that what my dad was doing as well he actually loved his work he was passionate about his his career as well and so that was what gave him the, the fire and the energy to like put so much into it and to make a successful career for himself and to also like support his family um, so I think like yeah uh, my dad from that aspect was a huge influence and I e every day I'm I'm like seeing the way I approach climbing and the way I approach my career and being like oh geez yeah I'm just my I'm a father's son <laughs> definitely and um, with um, like you know you spoke earlier about the fact that you know climbing has got so many diverse disciplines obviously when you just well, what made you decide essentially to change from that if you want sport and bouldering because you had such great success in that? You know, you you moved on to the sort of some extremely good grades really quickly and consolidated them really well. What made you transfer that into the trad side of things and the alpine side of things because they're so different, such a big different skill set? And then 
who who were the influences for that or was that self-driven um yes i think i think it's natural to to kind of lose interest with things you've been doing for quite a long time because things things do tend to get stale um i think i think that's why climbing is so good there's so many things you can you can uh, you can try and you can and you can um explore and the good thing about it is that all the skills are relatively transferable you know so as a, as a boulder and sport climber i was i was kind of traveling all over the world and i was trying trying hard sport climbs but after after a while i was finding the type of challenges quite one dimensional and it's it's interesting like it's 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 gone complete. It's gone it's gone in a circle. I think when I was about twenty four, I was I was kind of losing the the sight, losing the energy for for just going out and trying something that was purely physical. Um, it was a purely physical challenge. It was all about just how hard you could pull and the smallest hole. The community in sport climbing and bouldering, they were very focused on grades, which again, if you're not a climber, it's hard to understand. But I I don't know. It'd be like only focusing on stats in football, you know, like how many goals someone scored or, or something like that. Whereas in what I, what I got, I got like a, an introduction through my mentors into trad climbing. And I realized that it was a little bit less grade focused and more about the adventure and, and the experience of going out into the mountains and having these big wild adventures. And, uh, and I did this, I did this one trip that basically changed everything. And it was actually to the Dolomites. Um, and it, it's funny, Adam, because you have a story from the Dolomites as well, where you went, <laughs> you went with Neil McGeeky and Johnny Stocking. Yeah. I had such a similar experience to you. Oh. <laughs> it, totally, it totally changed my life, um, my experience. I think, I think maybe I went the year after you guys went. Basically, um, I'd heard about this climb called Bella Vista, and it's on this humongous, big 500 meter uh, piece of rock called Chima Ovest, as, as part of the Tracime de Lavaredo um, sort of feature in the Dolomites. And, uh, and, I, I, and I went there and I had it for some reason, I don't know how I got it in my head. I might have seen it on a, in a magazine or a poster, but I had it in, got it in my head that I wanted to do the thing. And my Australian friend, Logan, basically said he'd come in and climb it with me. And uh, we got there and I had like such little experience doing this sort of thing. It was way out of my league, like way, way, way out of my league. Um, but we went for it regardless. And we ended up, we ended up doing it. And uh, halfway up the wall, I just completed the hardest pitch but this like big storm was rolling in. It's really classic in the Dolomites to get these afternoon storms. And we were like, we still had like 300 meters or 250 meters left of the climb to do. And we knew if we kept on climbing, we were just gonna get wet and cold and it was potentially gonna be very dangerous. So we decided to just sleep on this little like one meter ledge together and we didn't have any sleeping gear we didn't have anything it, we're just in like a, a jacket and and he's logan's like five foot one you know and i'm six foot so basically he like little spooned me you know he was just like snuggling up on this tiny little ledge we were clipped with a sling to this hammered in piton piton is like a metal thing that you hammer into the rock we're just clipped into this thing like a sheer drop right below us and i remember all night couldn't feel my legs. The rain was like hitting the back of my back of my down jacket, which isn't even waterproof. Um, and it, it was just a miserable night of my life. And I can remember like looking out and seeing the lights of the towns um, through like the mist and the rain and being like, oh my God, like I just want to be down there. I just want to be off this ledge. It's horrible. And uh, in and in about like sort of six in the morning, the light kind of came, and we're just like, right, let's let's just climb and get out of here. We climbed up, we got to the top, we descended, and we went back to the uh, the cafe at the lodge. We sat there with a warm cup of tea. Both of us were just silent, and we're just like, that was bloody awesome. <laughs> 
And it was so funny, like the 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 sort of change in in the change in attitude from being up there, just wanting to be off. And then now that I'm down and warm, all I just wanted to be was like back up there doing it again. And uh, so that was like an introduction to what we call in climbing type two fun. It's basically fun after the activity is finished, you know, because it's not fun during. And um, and then I was like, wow, I want to do more of this. I want to do more of this. I want to I want to be scared because you know, actually being scared, pushing yourself, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, is actually really good it's really fun it can be really enjoyable and it can be a great learning experience and i was like how do i how do i get into more of that sort of thing uh, and i realized that sport climbing and bouldering wasn't offering that at all and so i was like right i'm going to get into to, to, to traditional sorry to traditional climbing and big wall climbing multi-pitch and alpine climbing this is the, this is what um bella vista was it was a, a big multi-pitch a big alpine climb and so i basically and didn't look back and uh, and since then, you know, it's just been, you know, it's been like climbing all around Scotland, doing traditional climbing, and trying to push push my limits, my mental and physical limits, sort of side by side, and um, going on trips to you know Patagonia, to Yosemite, doing big wall climbs, um, kind of just exploring exploring that world of things. Um, and and it's funny actually because. Now, I think I, I did a few years where I basically only focused on that stuff. Yeah. And, and more recently, in the last two years, I've actually kind of come back to sport climbing because the two are very transferable skills. You actually need to be able to be a good sport climber to be able to climb hard. And, and I've actually found a lot of enjoyment in sport climbing and bouldering again. So I, I, I'm kind of like a bit of an all-rounder now. I just kind of do everything. And I think that's, that's it's been a great, uh, a great journey for me. Yeah, what what a story that is! That's phenomenal. Um, you had some setbacks along your journey, um, like everyone does. How how did you overcome them? Those setbacks. Yeah, so I mean, the setbacks I've had, I've, I've not had. To be honest, I've I've not had any two major setbacks. I'd say, like, honestly, probably the biggest setback has been has been coronavirus lockdown. Yeah. You know, honestly, that has been the biggest setback. In some ways, um, you know, I had a trip uh, for Pakistan planned. It was it was meant to be the biggest trip of my life. It's something I've been preparing for for like the last few years, um, and and that got cancelled. Um, my, all my training facilities they were all shut down, so I had no access to training for a while. In a sense, my whole purpose in life had had just been chucked aside. Um, you know, for for a good few months. I was uh, I'd gone from living quite a nomadic lifestyle where I just like traveled in my van climbing all the time living outdoors living and breathing the outdoors and living and breathing and climbing and and I suddenly like forced to spend all my time in a 50 meter squared flat in the city center of Edinburgh with my girlfriend and um, just like in close proximity to each other for quite a long period of time with no access to the thing that I love um, so that was quite a challenge um, and um, I guess I learned quite a few things during this time um, namely that I actually never I don't need climbing you know I I can find purpose in in other things I was very surprised and actually everyone was very surprised at how I was able to adapt to this to this situation because I, I thought I would need to be outdoors. And actually, in in about two months, I had nothing more than a fingerboard to train on, which is essentially just a, a, a wooden a wooden thing you stick above your door and hang mm -hmm. off. It, yeah, and all I did for two months was hang off that, you know. And but I, I got into this, this routine. I woke up in the morning, had a cup of tea. Do my fingerboard session and um, I would you know find other things to do during the day and then the evening I would do my core routine and do some, some pull-up training and, and that was pretty much all I did for two months and then um, and then after a while um, I moved back into my parents house and uh, and they had like a shed and I actually built a climbing wall in the shed <laughs> yeah 
so, so that was that was pretty cool. But what, what was funny is it's a tiny little climbing wall. It's basically about seven or eight foot tall. Yeah. Um, and I just scattered it with holes. And uh, I was amazed at how I was able to basically continue to train at an, a really, really high level on this small piece of overhanging plywood. And, uh, and actually, it was funny, when all the climbing wall facilities opened back up, the, the climbing wall that I usually go to, which is two minutes up the road, it's it's like a um, it's like um, an amazing facility, like huge climbing center with every type of hold and every, you know you can imagine. Um, and I only went three times, and I kept climbing in the shed board, because, the shed climb wall, because I actually found it was more specific to what I actually wanted to train. I could change the holds myself. I could didn't have it already done so so actually the whole the whole lockdown the whole um the whole setback ended up being a massive learning curve where I, I realized um you know how to train more effectively for my for my projects I learned that you know in the in the event of not being able to climb I, I can do other things that will be equally as you know good for my climbing and for my and for my goals in the future um, and, and the other thing which I think helped massively, um, the last part of this question was, I ended up exploring new environments to practice my climbing. Um, really something that I think very few people have kind of done before. And that was, um, I basically looked at the urban structures around, uh, around the flat, and not, not in the flat, but like in the sort of nearby area and sort of looked at them and said, could I climb these for training? And I ended up finding a couple of bridges that had these cracks underneath the bridges. Um, and I basically climbed those. And they ended up being a huge, a huge part of the summer of lockdown um, because it gave me um, that, uh, that, uh, that sort of sense of adventure and exploration that I'd been missing out on um, without being able to travel. And I'll be honest, um, it sounds crazy, but I would say that those months train, climbing under that bridge, trying to climb all the cracks, were probably some of the most adventurous and most exploratory periods of my climbing in my whole life. Um, and it was really cool to sort of like explore this new type of climbing in the, the urban, in the concrete, you know, uh, of Edinburgh. And, and it's really funny because we posted up pictures and videos of us doing this. And it ended up just going worldwide. And now people all over the world are like looking at bridges in a completely different way. And I, you know, I, I get I get pictures like every day from people in America, in uh, in Malaysia, in Australia, you know, in South America, you know, like of them finding bridges and going climbing on them. So it's kind of it's kind of cool that this thing just like originated just in Edinburgh, and uh, and it's. It was just it was just a much a bizarre thing to happen to be honest. But yeah, it was it was amazing and it, it provided a, it provided a lot of opportunities. No, that's quality there. The two things that I've got I've got from that um story there is one, make the most of everything you've got. Um secondly, I think in all the shops around the world now, I think Robbie Phillips is gonna have climbing sheds going out of the doors, which is <laughs> Oh, brilliant. No, good. On, on the flip side then, Robbie, you've had lots of accomplishments and still lots more to come, but is there anything that sticks out in your mind that you're most proud of at present and why? Um, I mean, obviously, the the Bella Vista, the Dolomites one, that, that one was like a really good one because it was my first big multi-pitch alpine climb. Um, I, I dealt with real debilitating fear for the first time in my life. I, I can remember like... Um, sitting on the hanging belay with like two or three hundred meters below my feet i was just so scared and yeah. the crux pitch goes through this super exposed overhanging airy um sort of part of the crap part of the wall it is the most it's probably the steepest most exposed piece of rock on the planet this humongous roof and uh, i basically just had to climb through this thing and i remember just having to talk to myself for committing to it um, and just and just being like, you know, you have to commit fully if you want to succeed on this. And 
before I actually went for it, like before I actually um, went for that pitch, I remember my partner Logan basically saying to me that he was never going to be able to do it. And that realistically, if I didn't do it today, then we're probably not going to be coming back. So I had like, I was like, right, I have to do it right now. So I think, I guess like dealing with the, dealing with the conditions, dealing with the fear um, and the fact that that was my first experience of something like that and overcoming it. I think that, that probably stands out as one of my greatest accomplishments ever. Um, there was also um, another thing that happened the year after. And again, it was, it was actually the north face of the Eiger, which is quite a famous thing, uh, and just the world, world over as well. And, uh, and it's really funny because I climbed, this, uh, I climbed this line up the north face called Paciencia, um, which was first ascended by a guy called uh, Uli Steck, who died actually about four or five years ago. And, um, and this, I, I basically, I made the fourth or fifth ascent of it actually. And uh, when we went for that, again, it was, it was way out of our league. Like it was way, it was, it was like, if I had said I was going to go climb that to someone who actually knew what it was and what it entailed, they would have just been like, there's no way you'll do that. You, you should even bother trying. But I don't know, maybe a bit of, uh, a bit of that kind of like, I'm not going to, not, not, not arrogance, but like not really knowing, you know, what, what it was and kind of just being a bit blasé i was like we kind of went for it and we kind of just had our we kind of just you know proper like let's just go for it and see what happens kind of thing and uh and we were out of our depths it was close to our limit but it was very good style we went totally ground up um and there was so many chat times when i almost fell off and almost didn't do it um but somehow we did and I think I think the main the main thing I learned from that was we were I mean bottom line we were willing to fail we were willing to have to, to you know that this could be too hard this might not be possible but we were willing to try and and that was key and uh, and we managed to get up it and uh, actually if I want to say um, if if there's any one thing that I've done in my career that really made my made my career i would have said the scent of the north face of the eiger by a paciencia was it um when i got down from that climb i didn't realize what how what a big deal it was um i uh it was quite funny because you know although i i lived for climbing um the one I, I i'm actually a little sometimes i'm a little bit um i can be a bit like uh I don't know what the word for it is, but like I just I just don't know what um, how important some some things are. You know how how big a deal like some climbs are. And um, I don't really read the I hadn't at that time I hadn't read any literature on the North Face of the Eiger, so I kind of you know I, I didn't know to what extent doing the North Face via that particular route was a big deal. And so when we got down, having done it, um, told a few people, and then it started kind of getting out. And then that evening, I was getting calls from Boulder, Colorado, from like the the claim magazines and like, the websites, and they wanted to do interviews with me. And I was like, oh, geez. Um, and still, years on, I get I get like people. I meet people, and they'll be like, oh, you did the North Face Eiger via Paciencia, and I'll be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's still, I'm super surprised by it. And uh, it, and yeah, and I ended up getting one of my biggest sponsors as well, um, Patagonia, like about four or five months after and and a conversation that kind of the actual the actual being on the north east eiger i met a guy whilst we were up there who ended up introducing me to the guy who was the mate the, the, the brand manager for patagonia who ended up giving me the giving me a position for patagonia and being with patagonia has been a highlight of my my kind of like you know professional climbing career you know in terms of like working with working with a sponsor so yeah, I'd say the North Face Eiger is was the second one, and I'd say like the third, the third uh, accomplishment I would say that has been the biggest, one of the biggest things was uh, this thing called the Alpine Trilogy, um, and again the Alpine Trilogy is a is a trio of Europe's um, really hard Alpine multi pitches, kind of similar to Bella Vista uh, in style, uh, and and in their environment. Uh, back in the 90s, they were the hardest rock climbs in the world of that style. 
And uh, I remember Neil McGeeky, my mentor, talking about it on a car journey when we were driving back from Malham Cove in Yorkshire. Uh, and I can remember at the time, this guy, Harry Berger, had just completed the trilogy. At the time, I think he was one of only two people to have completed the trilogy. And since then, only two more had completed the trilogy. And, uh, and that's, in, that's in like the world, you know, like, so like, it wasn't just, yeah, it was like a very small number of people had, had basically completed this, this uh, challenging set of climbs. And I remember I was like 16 years old, Neil talking to me about uh, the Alpine trilogy. And uh, I was just, it's for some reason, it, it, even at that point, although I didn't really know anything about any of the individual climbs, it was just something that was in my mind. I, I just wanted to do it. And I thought actually, I thought for, I actually did think about it recently. I was like, why, why did it actually, why did that plant a seed in my mind? Why, why was that so important? And I think it was, I think it was because like, I've, I've kind of always wanted to, to kind of know, feel that I was an accomplished climber, to feel that um, I could go out and I could, I could be comfortable in any environment and uh, and put myself in like these stressful scenarios and be able to kind of overcome the obstacles and i guess these this trilogy of climbs was um you know i guess was proving to myself that that was possible um so over the course of five years um about i would say about 10 years after maybe like you know 13 14 years after i first heard about the alpine trilogy i actually set about going for them and, and trying to do them the first year was 2015 with Silbergeier in Switzerland, um, and that was meant to be uh, what, that was meant to be like the sort of middle middle of the, the three in terms of the difficulties. Um, I ended up doing that really quickly, and after I did that one, I was like, "Oh wow, you know, maybe this isn't going to be that hard after all." And it was another two years after that that I went for End of Silence, which uh, was in the, the southern German Alps. And that ended up taking me the whole summer, and that was meant to be the easiest. And it was fun. it was funny because I ended up just getting stuck on this one small section of basically three meters uh, on a five no three three hundred and fifty meter wall, and uh, and over the whole summer just got stuck on this one section. And uh, on the very last go I had on it, um, I injured my finger, and I can remember feeling the pain in my finger having to falling off, going back down to the belay and realizing that, um, you know, I had one last chance at doing this because tomorrow my finger was going to blow up the size of a, a peach, you know, it's just going to just like, it's, it's going to be horrible. So I was like, right, I've just got to get this done now. And then unbelievably just like that, that like sudden requirement to just get on and do it was enough to maybe get to the top. Um, and I did that one. And then about two years after that, um I went and tried the final one, which was the hardest. That one's called this Kaiser Neukleider uh, in the Wilder Kaiser in uh, in Austria. And uh and again that one was that's the hardest and it was a huge, huge undertaking, huge challenge. Um and again it took me the whole summer to complete. But um I remember doing it and on the last the last pitch, the last piece of climbing, I was with my friend Mish. And we were at this, uh, we were at this little Beely ledge, and uh, he had actually completed the pitch just prior to me, and I was getting really stressed because I wasn't completing the pitch, I wasn't managing to do it, I was falling off the start, and uh, and he came down, uh, I came, I, I lowered me down to the Beely, and he he'd, uh, he just said, "Man, you just got to keep smiling, Robbie, just keep smiling," and I was like, "Okay." I'll just keep smiling, you know, because I was getting frustrated and I was getting upset. So I basically went for it and I was like, I'm not going to put pressure on myself. I'm just going to enjoy this. This is going to be a fun experience. I'm going to, if I don't do it, it doesn't matter. And I tried hard and I gave it my all and I got, and I got to the top and that was it. That was done. And when he lowered me, basically we got, we got to the top, we hugged and we, we abseiled back down that ledge. And whilst I was climbing, he'd taken in chalk and like, basically made a smiley face on the rock and went, Robbie, all you had to do was keep smiling. <laughs> and yeah. that was that. And, uh, and yeah, so I guess like the Alpine trilogy was complete and it was essentially, it was five years of, of uh, 
training, five years of focus on this main objective to complete. Um, but essentially, it was 15 years in the making from when Neil had uh, first told about told it to me. And I guess it just proved to myself that I can overcome great challenges, you know, with patience and a directed approach and with small steps towards a big goal, I can achieve that. Yeah, oh, great message. And what what's what's the what's happening in the future then with Robbie? What's what's the ultimate uh, achievement you, you're going for? What 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 would you be really really happy with doing? Well, it's funny. Um, I've always had this approach to climbing that he won is is the is the pinnacle. You know, um, I guess I guess that's why I love climbing because you know I meet climbers who are in their sixties, seventies, in eighties who are still like pushing their own personal limits. They're still going out and having fun and challenging themselves. And, uh, and you know, they've all got countless stories to tell from amazing things they've done. Mm. Um, and of course, throughout their life, they'll say, you know, that this one was a really special one. But I don't think, I don't think any one thing, you know, you don't, you don't, want, you don't want any one thing to be the pinnacle. You don't, want, you, don't want, you don't want to focus on one thing and it to be like, that's what I'm striving for. And once I do that, I'm going to relax. Because that's, that's very rarely the case in climbing. Um, and it's, very, it's never been the case for me that when I finish something, I'm, I relax and I'm happy. Usually what happens is I finish something and then I go, what's next? <laughs> you know? And um, my approach to climbing has always been, I want, I want my objectives, I want my thing, the things that I'm doing, the challenges to, to teach me something or give me some new skills or abilities to be able to do something else next after that, to be able to take it a step further. Um, so I guess like, you know, like my, my, my sport climbing and bouldering career uh, and my, my competitions actually to begin with, they, they helped teach me how to train indoors for climbing. My sport climbing and bouldering uh, objectives taught me how to climb well on rock. Um, the my first experiences of you know multi pitch climbing taught me how to deal with fear. Um, trad climbing in the UK taught me how to better place gear efficiently and move fast on that terrain, um, and to deal with like lots of uh, complex uh, systems and, uh, and 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 yeah complex challenges. Um, and then all the big objectives that I'm undertaking now, all these expeditions. Again, they like my first trip to Patagonia, like was an expedition that taught me how to survive in like a sort of wild environment for three months, um, you know, with no access to supermarkets or anything like that. So you learn all these new things, and uh, and and I guess like now again, I'm just I'm just looking at what the next objective is. So realistically, for me, that the next objective was Pakistan. I want to go to high altitude, big wall climbing because i want to take what i've learned in the alps and what i've learned in in rock climbing onto a big base in a high altitude environment uh, on an expedition i guess that's like the culmination of that whole lifetime of uh, of climbing and so that was that was the trip that got back that got um that got cancelled uh last year and it's you know although we said this year it's probably going to be the trip that's cancelled this year as well because unlikely we're going to be doing any international expeditions. Um, but um, it's still the thing that I'm looking forward to uh, the most at the moment. I'm I'm kind of like that's that's what I want to go and do. Um, I, I want to. There's a so basically the trip is to Pakistan to the Trango Towers, which uh, are you know, seven thousand meter high. Uh, I peak, but the main the main feature of it that I love is the fact that it's just a sheer vertical granite base, um, which uh, in that in that harsh uh, high altitude environment, which is going to sort of just basically test everything I've learned so far um, to the extremes. And that's that. Yeah, that's probably my next big thing. What are Robbie Phillips's three non-negotiable behaviours that you'd expect from yourself? And anybody else you'd come into contact with. Okay, so um, the first one. Um, this, I mean, I, I think this is the most important actually, and it's always try hard. Um, if I fail trying my hardest, 
I can accept that. Mm -hmm. But knowing I didn't give my all is what hurts me most. There's been a few times in my climbing career where I can really remember when I didn't try my hardest. Um, and, uh, and it's, it, you know, they're actually, in some ways, they're the most memorable moments because they really, like, I'm just like, oh, I wish I'd just done this, you know, properly and not, and not sort of like essentially given up. I, th I, think, I think in class, sometimes important to do as well. You know, you can give up with good reason whether it's bad weather, dangerous conditions, objective dangers, out with our control, um, it's, that's okay. You know, you want to live to fight another day. It's mm -hmm. as much skill knowing when to back off um, and being big enough to accept it on the day. Um, but at the same, but you know, when, when you know you can give your all to something, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to be your own saboteur, which is actually, which is actually my, my second non-negotiable behavior, like not being, your own saboteur, because um, it can be scary to to try hard because you know you might fail, and uh, I, you know I, I've met I, I've done it myself, um, and it's a hard thing to overcome. And I've met a lot of climbers um, actually over the years who were striving to become professional climbers or striving for you know personal uh, ob you know objectives and challenges. And they ended up becoming their own saboteur by not allowing themselves to try their hardest. I guess, I guess trying trying hard is like the the culmination, you know, of it all. Really, like before every climb I get on, I audibly say to myself, "Try hard." That's what I say to myself. That's my my inner mantra. And um, when I'm on a climb, in the midst of it, um, and I and I assess the risk properly and I know that I'm happy with them I will say to myself try hard like speaking to inner Robbie and um, so that everything else is just like um gone you know there's no other thought processes all I have to do is climb and try my hardest yeah. and uh, and that's and that's it um and my third I would say non-negotiable behavior is to try and stay humble really um, I never want to let my ego get the better of me. Um, I think ego is at the heart of some of the biggest failures in climbing, in anything, actually. Um, if you ever believe that success is inherited or given, that's completely incorrect. It's false. You know, su you know success is earned, uh, bottom line. Um, and also, I never wanted to, to forget who's helped me um, along the way, which is why I, you know, place such a, heavy importance on uh, on my on the people who my mentors just but also anybody who's who's just given me a wee bit of advice here and there um i've always remembered it and i've always very much appreciated it which is why i've always tried to give back uh, as much as possible to the climbing community whether it's to young climbers who just getting into the sport or whether it's young climbers who are already competing at a high level but are looking for advice or just any climber, you know, anybody who anybody at all who who looks like they need help or support, I, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I think it's really important to try and give back, um, especially when you've been given so much. Yeah, no, good. And then that links on to the last question. Really, is talking about advice, and if if Roy Phillips could go back to being a twelve year old boy, maybe at Stockport Grammar School, what advice would you give yourself, knowing what you know now? Um, I would honestly say um, the best piece of advice I can give to anyone, and that, that includes any pupil, um, is try your best to find your passion and, and purpose. Um, finding, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, you know, but my, my, my mum, I think, I owe a lot to my mum because, you know, she was, very adamant. I tried as many different things to try and find what I really loved doing because she knew that that would make me happy. Yeah. Finding climbing at 15 years old gave me a career, gave me a, a community and a life that I love now. I mean, I go to sleep at night excited for what tomorrow tomorrow brings, you know, um, often to the detriment of my sleep cycle because um, I'm just too excited for, for what's coming next. <laughs> um, but finding a passion or purpose isn't easy. Um, 
the worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do actually is settle for less than your worth. Like you're all worth, you know, you're all worth it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you deserve to find something you love and make something off it. And it doesn't matter how long it takes because honestly, I'm, I'm meeting people that, um, I'm, I meet climbers who found climbing at like a, a later stage in life and they're realizing it's their, they realize it's a passion and they're, you know, they, they love it and it, it just changes their life completely. I'm obviously not saying that climbing is for you to try and find what you really love because you know if you find what you're passionate about, you will be able to give all the energy you have into it. And it's it's almost like you know, success achieving achieving and success with the, you know with a passion is so much easier than you know trying to achieve success when you're not passionate about it. And yeah. I think uh and yeah, I, I know I, I know people on the other side of that who do things that they they are not passionate about, and it I think it leads to rather unhappy life actually. So I would say that that would be my my one piece of advice: find try try and find your passion, and even if it takes your whole life, um, you know, just keep looking, you know.